Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. To be joined today by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, as well as His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness, and His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Um, who are here to talk to you about the high-level event on debt and liquidity. Before we start, just a few ground rules for those joining us virtually. Uh, please uh, keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking. Um, if you have a question, please uh, put your name and the name of your media outlet on the chat. And lastly, interpretation is available from French to English, and you should have received uh, details to access it. For those in the room, you can use your ear shells. So we will start with opening remar remarks, and then we will take a number of questions. Uh, Secretary General, sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Today's meeting is aimed at preventing a debt crisis that would have the greatest impact on the poorest people in the most vulnerable countries. But the impact will not stop there. It cannot be confined to any region or category of country. There have been credible forecasts of losses of global output in the trillions of dollars. And the United Nations has been warning of this crisis since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic a year ago. Unfortunately, not enough has been done to support those countries, many thousands of countries, that are at highest risk. We are already in the worst global recession in 90 years. We cannot walk head on, eyes wide open, into a debt crisis that is foreseeable and preventable. Many developing countries face financing constraints that mean they cannot invest in recovery and resilience, nor can they access the vaccines that provide the fastest route out of the pandemic. A global vaccination gap threatens everyone in developing and advanced economies alike. Developing, developing countries urgently need access to additional liquidity to respond to the pandemic and to invest in a sustainable and inclusive recovery. And today we are united in calling for urgent, bold and decisive action. And I commend the strong leadership of Prime Ministers of Canada and Jamaica who have been vital partners in this process. The old rules simply do not apply. We need to change the rules, putting people and livelihoods at the center of the decisions. I'm encouraged by the growing consensus around the need for increased liquidity through the issuing of special drawing rights by the International Monetary Fund one year after we first called for these. And I renew my call for the voluntary reallocation of unutilized SDRs to support vulnerable developing countries, including middle-income ones. And we also need to see far far bolder steps on the three-phase approach to debt that we have advocated from the start. First, a moratorium on debt payments, second, targeted debt relief, and third, reforms of the international debt architecture. Fresh financing by international financial institutions, the G20's Debt Service Suspension Initiative, and the Common Framework for Debt Treatments are welcome steps, but we must go further and faster. The SSI must be extended into 2022 and made, av made available to all highly indebted countries, including also vulnerable middle-income countries that might request it. The common framework must be complemented with initiatives and instruments so that participating countries are not penalized with downgrades to their credit ratings. Additional targeted debt relief will be needed. Options include debt swaps, buybacks, and cancellations, and the private sector must be brought into the dialogue. In the long term, we need an international debt architecture that works for all, with agreed principles and restructurings that are timely and adequate. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, in a global pandemic, we cannot separate economics and health. We are in danger of emerging from COVID-19 with a two-speed world that is already starting with the unequal distribution of vaccines. If half of the world cannot access vaccines, there is a danger of a successive waves of COVID-19 over the next few years. And this could undermine the effectiveness of existing vaccines with a continued devastating impact on lives, livelihoods, and the global economy. 
If we heed the lessons of the pandemic, we'll invest in safety and resilience, in strong global health systems, and in a robust financial architecture for the 21st century. And together, we can emerge from this year of terrible loss with new momentum and build a sustainable and inclusive recovery for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General. It is now my great pleasure to give the floor to the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen of the press. I am encouraged by the continued active participation in this important initiative on financing for development in the era of COVID-19 and beyond. Countries are indeed fighting on all fronts to meet the multidimensional health, social, and economic crises created by the pandemic. At the forefront of the challenges we face are those related to debt sustainability and the need for increased liquidity. The elevated debt risk that confront developing countries, particularly those that were already grappling with high debt burdens, require urgent action by the international community. We therefore welcome the efforts made by the G20 to establish the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, the DSSI, which has been extended through June 2021. However, we urge that it be further extended to at least the end of this year and uh, ideally to the end of 2022. While recognizing that many low-income countries are at high risk of debt distress, there are several middle-income countries that are also at risk. Whether they too will fall into distress depends on the depth and duration of the impact of the pandemic. Small island developing states, which are heavily reliant on tourism and remittances, are particularly vulnerable. We therefore call for an expansion of the DSSI to include vulnerable middle-income countries that request debt forbearance. Private creditors play a much more prominent role today in relation to the sovereign debt issued by developing countries. We must, therefore, engage them and the credit rating agencies within the context of our deliberations on debt sustainability if we are to get more countries to participate. There are significant signs of progress on the liquidity front, and I am pleased to note the support being shown to our call for the IMF to issue a new allocation of SDRs, as was done in the 2009 global financial crisis. At the systemic level, we continue to see the need for the establishment of a sovereign debt resolution mechanism. This will provide a framework within which sovereign debtors and their various creditors can collectively negotiate restructuring agreements in an orderly fashion, subject to agreed rules and procedures. Such a mechanism should include features that effectively address the long-standing problem of holdout creditors. Lastly, I emphasize the important role that can be played by innovative financial instruments such as debt buybacks and debt swaps, state contingent debt instruments, and specialized liquidity funds such as those proposed by Costa Rica and ECLAC. With that said, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I now give the floor to the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Sir, please. Hello. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Comme le secrétaire général Guterres et le premier ministre Holness l'ont dit, nous tenons aujourd'hui une autre réunion conjointe sur le financement du développement. Je tiens à remercier le secrétaire général du soutien qu'il a offert pour ces réunions et le premier ministre pour son partenariat dans le cadre de cette initiative depuis le mois de mai dernier. In the last year, our world has faced a pandemic, a global economic crisis, and the continued crisis of climate change. It goes without saying that these are very serious challenges on a very significant scale. 
Take the global economic front alone. Several countries have already defaulted. A significant number of emerging economies face serious fiscal challenges, and many developing countries are in debt distress. This comes on top of the economic effects of ongoing emergencies like climate change, which have only been made worse by the pandemic. As a world, we cannot afford to turn away. Instead, we must learn from this crisis and together set ourselves on a better path. L'année passée, le Canada a tenu des réunions de haut niveau avec le Premier ministre Holness et le secrétaire général Guterres pour définir notre réponse mondiale. Aujourd'hui, on continue cet effort. Notre réunion porte sur quatre grands thèmes. Améliorer les liquidités mondiales, prolonger l'allègement de la dette et en élargir la portée, réaliser de plus vastes réformes à l'égard de l'allègement de la dette et se pencher sur l'admissibilité à l'aide internationale. Nos conversations aujourd'hui orienteront aussi les, les importantes discussions qu'on aura prochainement aux réunions du printemps du FMI et de la Banque mondiale et au sein du G20 et du G7. Truly building back better from this pandemic means creating good jobs and growing clean, resilient economies. It means ensuring that the legacy of this crisis isn't one of rolling back progress for anyone. In fact, on that front, earlier this month, Canada launched a new task force on women in the economy to ensure that no one gets left behind. Because a better future is one where everyone has the chance to succeed. Le Canada veut trouver de vraies solutions qui vont aider tout le monde, y compris les plus vulnérables de ce monde, à se remettre de la crise. Ensemble, dans des réunions comme celle-ci, on peut continuer de bâtir un avenir plus prospère pour tous. Ça nous fait maintenant plaisir de répondre à vos questions. OK, we will now turn to questions. Um, a reminder to please try to stay on topic. And the first question will go to Edie Letterer from the Associated Press. Edie. Oops. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General, Prime Minister's Holness, and Trudeau for this briefing on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Welcome, and we're delighted that you're here. Um, I have a broad question for the three of you, um, which is, what, is the, what are the greatest obstacles to achieving the kind of debt relief that you are seeking right now? Is and is there a realistic possibility that what you would like to see will happen? And for the Secretary General, I couldn't let this opportunity go without asking him uh, one question about one of the real serious crises of the day, which is the escalation of killings in Myanmar. Um, it appears that the military leaders in Myanmar are deaf to the many international calls to stop the violence and restore democracy, and they've told your special envoy that increased sanctions wouldn't work. They don't care. They've lived with them before. So what realistically can the international community do to try and end the violence and restore democracy? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would start uh, with uh, this last point, and then we would go to the main question. I mean, what has happened uh, uh, in uh, the National Day of the Armed Forces was absolutely horrendous. And uh, uh, I had the occasion to uh, vigorously condemn it uh, and to say that uh, uh, it is absolutely unacceptable uh, to see uh, violence against the people at such high levels, uh, so many people killed, and uh, uh, such a stubborn refusal to accept the need to liberate all political prisoners 
and to uh, make the country go back to a serious democratic transition. Um, the past system was not perfect, we you know, but uh, there's no comparison with the present situation. I mean, we need more unity in the international community, with more commitment in the international community to uh, put pressure in order to make sure that the situation is reversed. Uh, I'm very worried. Um, I see with a lot of, of uh, concern the fact that uh, apparently uh, many of these trends uh, look irreversible, but hope is the last thing we can give up on. If I may, uh, starting in, in, the, in relation to the first questions. Well, power relations in the world are unequal. And uh, what we have been asking uh, 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 relates to a, a very drastic change in power relations in the management of the global economy. Uh, and I believe that this initiative led by uh, the Prime Minister of Jamaica and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Canada has been an initiative in the front, pushing for what needs to be done. But this uh, group that met today is not the decision-making group. We are saying what we believe needs to be done. And uh, the truth is that it's starting to have an impact. The SDRs were a taboo. Now the SDRs are on the table. And they will be moving forward. I mean, uh, aspects of debt relief are still, I would say, being done too, too little, too late. But uh, the... The, the problems are more and more on the table, and we feel that at the G7 and the G20 level, in the, the boards of the uh, 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 international financial institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, our ideas are starting to germinate. So I believe our role is to go on telling the world what needs to be done and hoping that progressively those that have decision-making capacity and the presence of Canada in this group is very important, as Canada is simultaneously a member of the G7 and the G20, and the leadership of Prime Minister Trudeau has been fantastic in this regard. Uh, I believe that uh, sooner or later, uh, things will be moving in the right direction. They are already moving in the right direction. We need to accelerate, we need to go deeper, but uh, I have to say that uh, um, uh, uh, more and more we feel that uh, our role uh, is extremely important because we have been putting on the table all the serious problems and uh, I believe uh, that the, the, those that uh, are crucial in decision-making processes are listening and are starting to move in the right direction. Okay, I will go to the to Prime Minister Andrew Holness, uh, if he wants to add anything, and then to Prime Minister Trudeau. It depends on where you're looking from, your perspective as to what would be the most difficult task. But I think we can generally accept that solving this potential debt crisis as a side effect of a pandemic would really be determined by the level of ambition and commitment of the global community to cooperate and to act in an enlightened fashion to avoid the potential debt crisis. Well, not potential anymore, the emerging um, debt crisis. So from a developing country point of view, a middle-income country point of view, where private commercial debt is playing a much greater role in our sovereign debt obligations, uh, a, a major hurdle would be to find ways of incorporating uh, the private sector in this global initiative. Thank you. Prime Minister Trudeau. Thank you. I think it is human nature uh, that in a time of crisis, people want to sort of hunker down and hope the storm blows over. Uh, we're not well adapted to global crises. Decades of uh, lack of sufficient action on climate change uh, shows how difficult it is uh, to coordinate and uh, work together to do meaningful, significant shifts uh, when a crisis seems so large and in some cases so far away. So there continues to be this instinct, even around uh, this pandemic, which is undoubtedly a global crisis, a global problem, uh, that people are hunkered down and trying to solve it locally uh, without really understanding that until we solve it globally, there won't be uh, a, a solving of it locally, not for real. 
Uh, so the the meetings that we've had, the leadership that uh, Antonio and Andrew have demonstrated in this uh, in this initiative are all about setting the table and putting forward the right conversations uh, so that we're developing the necessary tools uh, to ensure that we get through this, not just as a health crisis, but as an economic crisis as well, all together. Uh, and as the conversations continue in the international financial institutions, uh, in places like the G7, the G20, the G7 finance minister just met a few weeks ago and uh, had some strong uh, forward movement towards this as well, we are seeing uh, things come together and we will be ready with solutions as the attention of the world says, oh, we've really got to deal with this. Well, uh, that's what we've been working on over the past year uh, with a, a wide range of very strong voices. Thank you. Uh, we are now going to Catherine Levesque from the Canadian, La Presse Canadienne. Please. Oui, bonjour tout le monde. Catherine Levesque de La Presse Canadienne. Mes questions seront pour vous, M. Trudeau. Euh, tout d'abord, là, je me permets de vous faire réagir sur la Chine. Euh, J'aimerais savoir si le temps, bon, on a vu là, en fait, ces sanctions contre les parlementaires dans les derniers jours. On a vu vos efforts avec les alliés. Je me demande si le temps n'est pas venu de sortir l'article et d'imposer soit des sanctions économiques ou carrément d'interdire des fournisseurs comme par exemple la région du Xinjiang là, qui ont aussi euh, font appel à de l'esclavage à, à des esclaves pour euh, faire leurs produits donc j'aimerais vous entendre là-dessus si vous pouviez répéter en anglais également merci Évidemment, nous prenons très au sérieux la situation euh, de la défense des droits humains à travers le monde, y compris euh, particulièrement ces jours-ci en Chine. Euh, nous avions euh, pris action, euh, pas seulement seul, mais euh, en, de concert avec nos alliés. Et, et je pense qu'on reconnaît tous euh, que c'est euh, ce travail euh, multilatéral rassemblant euh, des pays divers qui reconnaissent ensemble les défis euh, qui, euh, auxquels on fait face, euh, c'est la façon d'avancer. Donc, euh, on a pris des mesures de sanction, euh, on a, a pris des mesures pour protéger, pour euh, aider euh, nos compagnies euh, à ne pas euh, se faire euh, euh, impliquer dans euh, l'exploitation euh, qui se passe à, à Xinjiang. Puis, on va continuer de travailler en parallèle et en partenariat euh, avec des alliés de partout dans le monde. We have always been very, very strong uh, in our defense of human rights and are uh, highlighting our concerns for what's going on in Xinjiang. Um, we have acted. Uh, we have acted in, in a way that has uh, giving uh, extra support and uh, ability for Canadian companies to ensure that they are not Uh, being uh, involved in questionable supply chains from Xinjiang. Uh, but we're also, more importantly, uh, working with our allies around the world to move forward on sanctions and uh, on concerted, uh, collaborated, coordinated uh, approaches uh, to really make the point that uh, our concerns about what's going on there are significant and need to be responded to by the Chinese government. Juste une question de suivi rapide sur un tout autre sujet. Euh, il y a maintenant le, le Québec, en fait, qui dit qu'il est en troisième vague. Je, je voulais savoir, en fait, à, à votre avis, est-ce que le Canada est en troisième vague de COVID-19 actuellement et est-ce que ça va se refléter dans le budget fédéral à venir? Merci. Euh, on sait depuis longtemps que euh, ces variants, euh, ces nouveaux variants euh, représentent une, une, une menace réelle euh, pour la santé des Canadiens et de gens partout à travers le monde. Euh, on est en train, évidemment, euh, d'espérer que euh, la vaccination euh, continuera de procéder de plus en plus rapidement pour euh, nous protéger contre une, une troisième vague. Mais en même temps, on doit constater que euh, ces nouveaux variants sont un peu partout euh, au Canada et à travers le monde. Et nous nous devons de réagir. Par rapport à la nomenclature ou l'identification, je vais laisser ça à nos experts en santé publique. Tout ce que je sais, c'est qu'on n'est pas sorti du bois encore. Il va falloir qu'on continue d'être vigilant et de faire attention. OK. Merci. Uh, now we'll try to go to a Jamaican reporter, uh, Henry Balford. Please. Henry Balford, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, James Bayes, Al Jazeera. Yes, can I ask um, uh, all three, um, uh, given the COVID-related issues that you've talked about, 
what now are the chances of the world meeting the SDGs? And if I could quickly follow up to the Secretary General on, on Myanmar, what's your message to the generals right now? I would suggest that now we reverse the order. I spoke first in the last uh, question. I, I think now it would be if Prime Minister Trudeau was the last. He should now probably be the first, and then uh, yes, sir. Uh, Prime Minister Holness, and then I will. In the end, I mean, we need to have some <laughs> democracy here. Some I'm democracy here. Up. Okay. <laughs> okay, Mr. Trudeau, please. Thank you very much. I think, uh, first of all, this crisis has shown us just how important it is uh, to keep moving and indeed to accelerate uh, on our adoption of the SDGs. Uh, these are all things that even though global pandemics are not directly recognized, uh, uh, there is talk about health in the SDGs. Uh, the, the challenge is that this pandemic has highlighted, whether it's the impact on women and girls, uh, the I I increased impact on the marginalized, uh, the in various health outcomes, particularly in the most vulnerable countries, uh, the challenges of uh, economic growth and opportunity. What we are seeing right now is a need for us to work together more and better than ever before and that is what uh, the SDGs are all about and I think uh, we will uh, need to be accelerating our approach to meet uh, the SDGs uh, in time. I think the, the urgency is greater than ever before and I believe that our capacity to achieve that um, just in demonstrated by our capacity to respond so many of us uh, strongly to this pandemic uh, means that we're going to be able to do it if uh, we set our minds to it, and I think uh, the world uh, is determined to learn from this terrible crisis uh, on how to move forward in a better way for everyone. Thank you, Prime Minister Holness, please. In a, in a strange way, I, I hold the view that whilst there may be some short-term deviation from the pathway of achieving the SDGs, that we will, the world will quickly return to the pathway of achieving the SDGs, primarily because of the, the impact of the pandemic in health and education. And uh, almost all developing countries will recognize that the recovery will depend on increasing their social spending on health and education, and to a, a, a significant degree as well for the development of broadband and digitization in their societies, uh, which is why we're here discussing how can we finance this? Uh, are we going to finance this uh, through rising debt uh, in how we've previously done it before in previous crises? Or are we going to take a more enlightened approach as the world in ensuring that there is even recovery, uh, fair recovery, right across the globe. Uh, so I'm optimistic based upon what I'm seeing and uh, hearing uh, in the international community. As um, the Secretary General said, this action, this initiative, uh, our voices are being heard. Uh, and uh, I am expecting that we will see in the near future uh, ambitious actions towards ensuring that the financing of the recovery and the emerging debt as a result will be managed in a far more sustainable way. Well, we were not on track before the pandemic uh, to uh, make sure that we'll be able to implement the SDGs fully uh, uh, in 2030. And one of the reasons why the pandemic has been so devastating is exactly because we were not on track in many of the issues that would be a good prevention against pandemics and other threats of this nature. Now, we are speaking, we, we are spending globally trillions and trillions of dollars, probably we'll be reaching 20 trillion at a certain moment. Now, if this money is spent, first, in a more equitable way among countries, and second, to support an inclusive and sustainable recovery, we can accelerate the implementation of the SDGs. If this money is spent just to go back to where we were, we will not go back to where we were, we will be much worse. And this is the choice that, first of all, needs to be done at the global level in relation to equity, and in each country, 
in relation to inclusivity and sustainability. And the picture is not yet clear. We are still seeing more investment in fossil fuels and in renewable energy, for instance, just to give an idea uh, related to, um, related to um, um, sustainability. And uh, we, we still see uh, 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 that uh, uh, we are not yet investing enough in uh, uh, strengthening health systems globally in a way that could prevent future pandemics much better than this one. So it's not yet clear. But we can do it, and we must do it, because the alternative would be a disaster, and uh, uh, there won't be an opportunity like this one. My message uh, to the military is very simple. Stop the killings. Stop the repression of uh, uh, the demonstrations. Release the political prisoners, and return power to those that have the legitimate right to exercise it. Okay, we will now go to Man al Midi from the Canadian Press. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, my question is uh, for you. Will you work with Canada's rich allies to allocate more resources to poor and middle-income countries to avoid a deeper recession caused by COVID-19 pandemic? And what are the measures that you would like to see uh, to support these countries? Yes, not only will we do that, that's exactly what we're here to do today. Uh, Canada, along with Jamaica and the UN Secretary General, have been leading these discussions on ensuring uh, that our economic recovery uh, be more, uh, more equitable uh, and more just right around the world. I think there are three uh, main areas that we've been focusing on. One is liquidity. Uh, countries need access uh, to uh, cash so that they can support their citizens and get through, and their small businesses, and get through uh, this crisis. We've seen uh, countries like Canada be able to, because we came into it with a very strong uh, fiscal position, able to do a tremendous amount of things to support uh, citizens so that our economy comes roaring back as quickly as possible. Not every country uh, is able to do that, and it, it is part of our own domestic self-interest uh, to see uh, countries around the world uh, succeed through this so that we can all get back to the global economy as, as best as we possibly can in a positive way. The second element is debt. Uh, we know countries are faced with crippling debt levels uh, that uh, we can all work together, but we need to establish a common framework to make sure that uh, all lending countries uh, are uh, part of the solution and as well private interests as well. And then we also need to look at uh, access and eligibility uh, to debt. As uh, Prime Minister Holness has pointed out a number of times, uh, there are middle-income countries that are not amongst the poorest in the world, but that are extremely vulnerable either to this pandemic because of their reliance on tourism, for example, or in generally to the crisis of climate change. They have higher levels of vulnerability, and we need to ensure that the international financial institutions are uh, ready to support them uh, as, uh, as we move forward, and that's very much what the conversations that uh, Canada is happy to be a, a co-leader on through this uh, through this process. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, China has just announced it's invited the UN Human Rights Council to visit Xinjiang. Xinjiang. Uh, does Canada want to participate in this? I think this is uh, excellent news. It's something Canada has been calling for for uh, a long while now, but I will uh, uh, defer to the Secretary General who has been uh, uh, leading, uh, leading the, the process as we've seen uh, recently in uh, getting uh, independent observers uh, into Xinjiang. As I had the occasion to say yesterday to the uh, Canadian uh, broadcasting system, uh, uh, we are seriously engaging uh, the Chinese government in order to uh, be able to have the mission of the Human Rights High Commissioner and uh, to make sure that that mission has uh, no unacceptable limitation. So uh, I hope that uh, this uh, negotiation will be concluded positively. Thank you. I'm afraid we only have time for one last question, and we'll go to Iftikhar Ali of APP of pa Pakistan. Please. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, although my question has been asked, but I will uh, ask the Secretary General, uh, who has used uh, very uh, 
uh, strong words like decisive action uh, to stave off the debt crisis. Sir, may I uh, ask you what decisive action you are looking forward uh, to stave off uh, debt crisis of the developing countries? Well, what we have been discussing uh, today are a number of very concrete things. First, in relation to the uh, debt uh, uh, suspension initiative, uh, to make sure that it is uh, extended uh, uh, to uh, 2022, uh, and to make sure that it, uh, its scope is enlarged, to include those vulnerable middle-income countries. We just saw the dramatic situation of the small island development states, but there are other situations of vulnerable middle-income countries that also uh, need to be uh, addressed. Uh, the same kind of consideration in relation to the so-called framework uh, for uh, debt uh, that uh, uh, is now being put in place, and the need to make it operational. Only three countries until now have applied. There is an important conversation that uh, needs to engage the private sector, the credit rating agencies, all uh, in order for them to come together and to allow for these operations to be successful. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I think we need to recognize that uh, um, beyond uh, uh, the debt relief that is necessary at the present moment, there must be a serious discussion on debt architecture and uh, recognition that uh, there are many gaps and uh, uh, many structural problems that need to be addressed and that we need to bring all actors together uh, to make sure that we move into a sustainable debt architecture in the future. Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, oh. j'aimerais bien vous poser une question sur l'Afrique. Est-ce que vous pensez que l'impact du Covid aura vraiment, euh, comment dire, ce sera dramatique pour l'économie africaine mais c'est évident, l'Afrique est le continent, en tant que continent, le continent le plus vulnérable. Euh, c'est en Afrique euh, qu'on euh, euh, qu voit euh, des, euh, enfin, la combinaison terrible des, de l'impact euh, du Covid avec les questions de sérieuses de développement, avec les problèmes de sécurité, euh, euh, les conflits qui continuent euh, et avec l'impact du changement climatique. Alors la vulnérabilité de l'Afrique devrait mobiliser mobiliser toute la communauté internationale pour un appui massif euh, au continent africain pour qu'il puisse se redresser euh, euh, face euh, au Covid-19. Thank you and I'll just ask if the prime minister prime minister Holness or prime minister Trudeau want to add anything else before we wrap up. Please. Um, I believe that the world has the capacity to avoid this potential debt crisis if we act with ambition and urgency. Uh, the idea of uh, staving off the debt crisis, uh, yes, it's about providing liquidity and uh, a structure within which uh, debt can be managed. However, it also relies heavily on uh, changing the investment flows to positively impact the economies of developing countries. And that has to be a very serious uh, conversation and consideration. Greater investment is also a part of the success equation. Secretary General, can I ask? The Sorry. The international financial institutions are having their spring meetings in the coming uh, weeks. The uh, G7 is going to be meeting. The G7, uh, the G20 uh, is working together. We need uh, all eyes to go not just to the vaccination challenges around the world, but also to the economic uh, challenges around the world. Uh, we know that getting uh, vaccines to everyone as quickly as possible is going to get us through this pandemic. But through to what? Uh, we need to make sure at the same time as we are focused on the health, we are also focused on the health of the global economy. And that means taking real action uh, by uh, leading countries around the world uh, to recognize uh, that it is not just in the global interest, but in their own interest to ensure a more equitable global recovery. We have the capacity to do it. We just need to develop the will to do it. And that's what we're working on all together. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the time we have. Thank you to everyone. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.